Okay. May you come to order? Clark will call the roll. Senator Busman? Here. Senator Figures? Senator Marsh? Here. Senator McClendon? Senator Pittman? Senator Ross? Senator Sanders? Senator Shelmut? Senator Brebaker? Here. Okay, uh, Senator Marsh, uh, would you call the, the, our one bill to the calendar, please? SB 45, sponsored by Senator Marsh. Okay, SB 45 is before us, and Senator Marsh? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your patience as a constituent in my office. Um, at this time, uh, Mr. Chairman, based on conversations I've had with you and others, I would like to offer this substitute. Okay. Uh, we're going to dispense with the reading of the substitutes. Uh, since everybody's had it, and I assume you've had time to look at it, uh, I, I need to go ahead. I have a motion to adopt the substitute. Second. All right. We have a motion by Senator Marsh and second by Senator Shellnut to adopt the substitute. I uh, call the roll. Senator Busman. Aye. Senator Figures. Senator Marsh. Aye. Senator McClendon. Senator Pittman. Senator Ross, Senator Sanders, Senator Shelnut, uh, Senator Brubaker. Hi. Okay, that's four yeas and zero nays. The substitute's adopted. Uh, now, right now I'm going to recess the committee meeting and we're going to move into the public hearing. And for those of you who weren't in the room, each side is going to get one ten-minute speaker and then we're going three minutes apiece back and forth until time's out. We have got to be... Uh, out of this room in about an hour and 45 minutes. So uh, when we have heard enough from both sides, we start being repetitive. I'm going to end the public hearing, and we're going to move on. Senator Sanders and Senator Fingers, it's great to see you. Uh, so will you call the uh, public hearing that has begun? And one thing, when your time's up, I'm going to cut you off, and we're going to stop talking and let the next person go. So will you call the first speaker? Uh, so on the speaking for SB 45, we're going to start with Emily Schultz. And if you say who you represent. Sure, absolutely. Uh, my name is Emily Schultz. I'm in the Alabama Coalition for Public Charter Schools. Um, I've been working for the last year, 14 months, on trying to gather as much feedback as we can on the issue of public charter schools in order to create um, a responsible bill that will create some really high quality options for families and educators. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the changes um, in the substitute um, and try to give you some sense of where some of that feedback came from. Um, we were meeting with folks up until about 2 p.m. yesterday to try to get as much feedback as we could. Um, so just to start, and I, I realize that we not some of the line uh, page numbers don't line up exactly. I'm going to try to cite for you in the sub what line I'm referring to. So the first one is page three, line seven. This is a prohibition against private schools converting to public charter schools. Page six, line 10. Um, this requires that a governing board of a public charter school, so the 501c3 that's over the public charter school, has to have at least 20% of its membership be parents and students who attend or have attended the school. That's just to ensure that we've got parent representation on that governing board. Um, Page 6, line 25, is the definition of nationally recognized authorizing standards. Um, there's a lot of... <coughs> Let's let her get through when she's So on page 6, line 25, um, there were some questions about nationally recognized authorizing standards. We tried to, to identify um, exactly what we were referring to in those. I brought an example of uh, nationally recognized recognize all the standards that's used in most places around the country, and I have several copies of this. Um, uh, and we included on page 7, line 15, um, no member of the governing board may have a financial relationship with the education service provider or the authorizer. There was some concern around transparency, um, so we wanted to really call that out, that we want these to be really locally driven, um, parents and community members. Um, on page 8, line 5, um, we deleted virtual education from the definition of public charter school as one of the, the themes that's called out as a possibility. Um, on page 10, line 20, uh, notwithstanding, that was a recommendation that we just be clarified that while public charter schools may have themes, 
and they are open enrollment. They must take anybody that wants to attend. Um, page 11, line 2. This just allows that if a student transfers from a public charter school back to a traditional district school, nothing in this act should prevent that district school from administering placement tests to figure out where that student is. Page 11, line 15. That just requires public charter schools to use the same uh, student information system that our State Department of Education uses. And that's so that they can talk to each other and we can see all the information about students as they transfer um, between a public charter school and a traditional um, Page 13, line 4. Um, we deleted um, the provision that allowed um, if a cap, the cap was not reached in a year, the remaining spots would roll over to the following year. We have taken that out, so there will be a cap of 10 public charter schools a year for five years. <coughs> On page 15, line 22, we wanted to clarify that um, any commission member can be removed if they don't um, perform the duties of the appointment. <coughs> On page 16, line 5, we wanted to clarify what a quorum meant and that you have to have a majority of the commission members in order to make a decision. On section C 6C, number 11, I believe that's on page 17. I'm not positive. I ran out of time. On six. This was a recommendation um, from the excuse me from the State Department of Education that um, the state superintendent was involved in any decisions that um, the commission used staff of the department. On page twenty. deleted in fulfillment of expectations, spirit, and intent of this act. We just felt like that language was a little fuzzy. I wanted to narrow in a little bit. Um, that is I'm sorry, I don't know. <coughs> if you give me two minutes while the next speaker is speaking. Um, page 37. We received a lot of feedback and was concerned about um, districts that were under federal desegregation orders. So we incorporated some language to require um, authorizers at both the local and state level to consider fully the impact that a charter school would have on um, a, a district's progress towards unitary status.
to. This was some language that we received from the teacher's retirement system. Um, conversion public charter schools are required to participate in the teacher retirement system. It is optional for the 10 startup public charter schools. This clarifies some of the administrative functions. <coughs> So on page 54, line 3, this clarifies that funding for a public charter school will come from the current line item, I'm sorry, yeah, current unit line item in the foundation program. Um, we worked hard with the State Department to try to figure out um, what implementation would look like for the first year in funding. Um, and so we are going to um, fund the first year of operation um, from the current, uh, current unit line item. And that's to ensure that districts that receive their money keep their money and we don't have to create, we don't have to take money from the local school system and give it to a charter school or the child issues to enroll in that charter school. And then on the last change that we have in the sub is on page 59, I believe. We'll get you that line, but basically it just makes sure that the audit that public charter schools go through adhere to the same standards that are required of annual audits of this Okay. Uh, Emily, that's time. And uh, I, we're going to, for the committeemen, we've obviously got a lot of people here who want to speak in a limited amount of time. So if you would keep your questions to the speakers direct. And uh, when we go into the committee meeting part, we'll all have our chance to... Uh, to give our opinions, but uh, Senator Biggers, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question, um, my first question, well, I'll just ask this one time. About the board at each charter school, it says that the parents, the parents of students as well as parents who had children there, is there any percentage breakdown of the type parents that will be on that board? Because you can very well end up with parents who had who had children on that board, uh, who had children at that school, and no parents who presently have children at, at that school. There wasn't any. There wasn't any talk of that breakdown. Um, I think the intent is just to make sure that people that are invested in the school, whether their children have gone through it and graduated. Or but if you truly, school. but if you truly want the parents' involvement. The parents who presently have children should definitely have a certain percentage um, of membership on that board. So uh, that is one thing that I would like to see. Uh, is that it for now? Yes, and I, I have two questions. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Schultz, and I will be brief. Uh, the first one is I've got uh, some emails from the Superintendents Association essentially saying that when a charter school makes an application and they say we're going to get, you know, 200, there'll be 200 kids from Aniston and 100 kids from this community and it's going to be 300 kids. And so they invoice those schools. But what if they don't actually attain the 300 student enrollment? How does the money come back to the systems? Yeah, that was a really good question um, that was flagged for us um, a couple weeks ago and that's why we worked through the current units change. Right. Um, so that it will actually be a real-time allocation based on the students that show up. Okay, so there's no money paid on estimates. Exactly, we deleted that section. Right. And one other one, on page 48, line 13, you have, uh, it says acceptance provided, and I'm on line 13, acceptance provided uh, in this act of public charter schools shall not be subject to the state's education statutes or any state rule, local rule, regulation, policy or procedure, and it goes on. What about, uh, state statutes dealing with like Child Protection Act, background checks, all those are matters of policy. Absolutely. So I will find a specific section, but there is something that um, carves out that they cannot opt out of federal or state laws related to health or safety. Okay. Um, so there's a fire code. All right. Great. That's... If there are no other questions right now, I would recognize Senator figures. Me being the person that pushed for for stronger child protection laws, um, 
since I've been in the Senate, I don't see anything wrong with that language going in this bill as well to make sure that um, anyone who has unsupervised time with, with the child has to have a background check. I absolutely agree. Thank you. Senator Ross. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and Emily, thank you for going over those changes. And of course, uh, let me thank the pro tem and, and his staff for uh, the willingness to at least be able to dialogue to go through some of these changes. Uh, however, I, I'd just like you to explain, uh, because one point that we had was that uh, point of local control. We, we've talked about this commission, uh, which, which is something that gives uh, me pause. Um, and as the changes have gone to, to do something that, you know, we think is palatable uh, in some areas, uh, the local control piece is one that is a, is, is, is a major issue. And we've tried to talk about ways that we uh, get there. But with this commission that's been set up, uh, you definitely uh, do not allow the school systems or the superintendents that uh, autonomy to make decisions for their area and have a commission that will, some who may have not even visited uh, some of these areas, uh, be able to make, make decisions. Uh, there's also an application process by which if, if the superintendents do not file the application, uh, then they somewhat waive their right to become an authorizer. But that gives the commission the ability to continue to appoint or to approve a charter school in an area where a system uh, really has kind of made a statement uh, that they don't want to have one there. Can you give me the rationale, first of all, to have, why we have set up such what I consider such a political commission, uh, in, for one, and the lack of local participation in that commission? Because I know we put one person on there. Can you kind of give me the uh, some background to that of why we do that? The other thing that gives me great pause uh, as a practitioner and as an educator, uh, you know, I had to go to school uh, to learn my craft. And we have talked about people having at least some type of alternative, uh, alternative certification to be involved in this process. But that's something that we, we just weren't able to, you know, kind of reach an agreement on. And, and so, uh, I gave the example of going to the hospital, and when I roll in, I don't want the person that signed me in to check me out. I want the doctor to check me out. Uh, what is it about uh, the certification that, that gives uh, those who are proponents of, of, of charter school uh, pause, uh, particularly when we're talking about people that you want to be in, uh, in tune with children uh, that, that, that basically have a working knowledge of how you how you teach young people. So those those are two things that, you know, and we worked on a lot of things, and I, I appreciate it, but, but, you know, it doesn't make me like it any much better, uh, but but I at least would like to get those things uh, off of the ground. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator, thanks, Senator, for those questions. I think um, in, in terms of the commission, I just want to clarify that the commission can only hear appeals in the case of startup public charter schools. Conversion public charter schools are all handled at the local level. They are not appealable. So that commission only has purview over the 10 startup public charter schools. So that's one. It's only an appeal body. We added, um, in an effort to make sure that the, the local perspective was represented on that commission, we added a rotating ninth member that is appointed by that local school system. Um, we added some language around standard of review to require a public hearing when they hear that um, so that that local community can come and testify and represent their perspective. We require them to consider the reason that that the application was denied. We also require them to consider the quality of, of school options that are currently in that community. Um, so we added a lot of checks and balances to make sure that the perspective of the local community was, was there. Okay, thank you, Ms. Schultz. Our next speaker is going to... Mr. Chairman. Yeah, All right, Senator Oh, I'm sorry. Absolutely. So certification is it, flexibility um, for public charter schools and economy is a, is a big priority for charters. Um, I would say that in your doctor example, you have the choice of which doctor to go to. You can look on the wall and see what degree they have and you can choose. Um, there are a lot of public charter schools. We are pushing the certification decision to the school level. There are a lot of public charter schools out there that only commit to hiring 
already certified contractors. But that's a school level decision. We don't mandate the charters have to do that from the state level. But they could decide to do that at the, at the school level. So if you want to send your child to a school that only has certified teachers, mm -hmm. there will be charter schools available that do that. We just don't mandate it. But very briefly again, I know we've had this discussion before. But explain to me how we prevent one company or one group from coming in and, and controlling the all ten of the of the charter schools and not therefore eliminating any other options for, for people to, to, uh, to provide that service. How do we prevent one company or one group of people from, from dominating and, and, and preventing anybody else from having any access to that option? So in the application, you cannot apply to more than one authorizer for the same school. So that's one check. You can't, you can't just do a blanket application to a number of authorizers. So that's one check. We also require in the application that if a charter school has another charter school, so if an applicant has another charter school already in existence, they have to disclose that in their application. They have to talk about the track record of that school, and they have to demonstrate whether or not that school has been successful. So the authorizer will be aware if the applicant has other schools. So we try, that's what, those are the kind of checks and balances we put in place to try to make sure that we didn't have one, a monopoly. Thanks, Senator. Uh, you can take a break, Mitchell, good job. Uh, <laughs> the superintendents have combined their time, and we're now going to hear from uh, Superintendent Dr. Wardenski. And he's, uh, he's speaking in opposition to Bill. <laughs> in Sunset, when we do Sunset, the podium is right here. No, I have. The committee. I need to take out the right chair. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. chair. So this is, this is all <laughs> All right, let's begin. Start with Tyler. Good morning, Senator. Uh, thank you for providing me this time. I don't know that the, the superintendents are here to oppose the bill. The superintendents are here in favor of stronger <coughs> legislation that improves education for children. All right. uh, towards that end, uh, just by way of introduction, I am Casey Wardenski. I am the superintendent in Huntsville City Schools. I've been there for almost four years now. Uh, we love innovation in Huntsville, as do many other school systems and many other superintendents. Uh, when I arrived in Huntsville, Huntsville had a $19 million deficit. Finances are important to us. We now have a $35 million surplus. While getting that surplus, we became the largest all-digital school system in the United States. Over 800 school systems have come to visit Huntsville to find out how to innovate in this area. Uh, innovation is in our blood, and anything that will improve education is good by us. Uh, but I have real concerns about this legislation, and I'll share just some of the key points with you. Uh, my experience in this area uh, has a foundation of managing six charter schools in Aurora, Colorado. There I was the chief financial officer for a 36,000 student uh, public school system that had uh, over 50 uh, traditional schools and six charters. Uh, our experience there with the charters were we had two that were mediocre, two that were good, and two that were extremely poor. Uh, I, I had to hire an independent team of auditors just to watch six charter schools. Probably half of my time as a CFO was spent on six charter schools because they were always teetering on the edge of financial impropriety, or bankruptcy. Now, uh, provisions that I think, and I think the superintendents would agree, are particularly important is autonomy is important. I agree with Emily, autonomy is important. They seem to think autonomy is vitally important, even with regard to teacher certification. Uh, we believe autonomy is important too, and we don't believe in a two-tier approach to education. If autonomy is important for the operation and success of charter schools, it's important for the, op the operation of the existing public school systems that we have. The AAA bill was designed, I thought, to help provide some of that flexibility and autonomy. I haven't seen it. Um, to get that, I have to go through our board and get their approval. Then we have to go to the state board and get their approval. I think I've got seven requests of which two have been approved. Um, nothing in the area as sweeping as what this charter bill would authorize to charter schools. So while you may think you voted for autonomy for public schools, I have not seen it as a superintendent. This bill would definitely give charter schools the kind of autonomy I would look for for my school. Um, resources. I'm not only interested in the startup resources, but ongoing resources. Charters should be paid for kids in their schools that year. Uh, what I saw in Colorado was after the 20-day count, kids started rolling back in to the existing public schools, typically for discipline problems, special needs students, English language learner students, and children in poverty were the ones to come back first. The money did not follow those children. Here, the money should follow the children. Uh, 
desegregation order. I saw the language in this, the, uh, the uh, substitute bill here regarding desegregation. I have no confidence that this meets the needs of Huntsville City Schools. 44% of the children in this state are in school systems that are under federal desegregation. That is not a trivial number. I would estimate in the last two years we spent over $2 million litigating our case. We will go to court next week, federal court, to have approval of our consent decree. That consent decree is over 180 pages long. We have years invested in understanding what it means. I have no confidence that if we were to turn that over to a state chartering organization or body to approve any chartering activity in our school system, that it would not run afoul of the many provisions in there that very specifically address all of the liberties that are afforded to charter schools with regard to themes, enrollment areas, uh, all those matters uh, that would become important to our federal court. Uh, I know this body is interested in local control, interested in the state having voice over state educational issues. With this bill, I believe we would be perpetually under federal control. And other systems could be very much in the same basket with us. Uh, so I'll address how we could uh, get to that problem. Um, we don't need to undermine the authority of local boards and superintendents. This bill is silent on the role of a superintendent. Now, who in the, the district is going to be uh, of a power and uh, resource level to analyze a charter application, a charter comp a contract? Certainly not the Board of Education. It's the superintendent and his staff. So where is the role for the superintendent here to do the legwork and understand what these charter bills and or charter authorizing documents would mean for a school system. Um, finally, uh, you've addressed the virtual school question, um, but I think the structure is very important. Um, from my experience in Colorado, it is not unusual to have a child enrolled in a school to get credit for that board member, and then that child leaves that school and goes to a different school and enrolls in that school. So moving kids around to get credit for a person to be on the board, or the person had a kid in the school for 10 minutes and they're now perpetually able to be on the board, that's bothersome to me because this is an area that's all about the money. Money governs this because it's a contract about change of hands of financial resources. So we have to be very careful that we don't invite principal agent problems, malfeasance, conflicts of interest, and that boards couldn't simply outsource to education management organizations from out of state to run all the charter schools in the state and all these different boards could do that. Um, this is an area that invites political influence. In one board election in LA Unified, LA has 15% of their kids in charter schools. $700,000 of out-of-state money came into the election of one board member in LA. That tells you how important the money is. Um, with regard to um, the visions of uh, the um, authorization of startup charter schools in areas that have consent decrees, uh, I would argue that the best approach is leave it up to the local board. Do not have appeal to a state entity. Uh, these orders are very complex, they're very expensive, and they involve years of work. The local board is in the best position to understand what would the implications of a startup charter be locally, and it must extend to enrollments of any students from a school system that are under consent decree. The court would probably view, in a very dim light, efforts to enroll kids from Huntsville in a charter outside of Huntsville that might just be out in the county and, and so forth. So I would just raise a word of caution on that regard. Um, with regard to um, the sorts of things uh, that are important, I would suggest that autonomy is very valuable. We have local money in Huntsville. Unfortunately, the school system has a good tax base and high military. Uh, autonomy doesn't just come from this bill. It comes from freedoms you can give superintendents. We, uh, I saw a reference from A-plus, I think it was, that they have for this bill because there's a school in Chicago, which um, students there all end up going to college, and it's affiliated with the university in Chicago. Well, in Huntsville, we're affiliated with the University of Alabama in Huntsville, not only will all of the students in that program go to college, they are in college. They earn 60 credits in that program while they're earning their diploma. You don't have to have a charter bill to move the authorities and the autonomies out of the realm of the local control to get that kind of freedom. We also have a school called Pinnacle School that provides alternative education and a credit recovery for our students. It works year-round. It does things we cannot do in the old way of school system operations. We're able to do that because we have local money. Money is a powerful tool to provide autonomy and freedom for charters. It can also be a powerful tool for school systems. I'd urge you to consider offering the same sorts of autonomy to superintendents and local boards. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's, uh, we really got a lot of people want to talk, so let's keep the applause for a minute. Uh, Senator, if you would stay there, Senator Sanders. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, uh, one, do you think it's really important to have community support to have excellent schools 
And if that's true, what will happen when you have, right, right under this proposal, you will end up with three school systems, essentially, one way or another. You'll end up with the private schools, the public schools, and the private school within the public school. What will that do to community support, in your opinion? Well, Ms. Senator, thank you. Uh, I believe local support for education is vital. 88% of students in Huntsville do attend a public school. Um, we have broad local support. We have high millage rates that demonstrate that. Um, what I see, though, is that uh, this would take local control and move it a bit to the state level through the authorizing. Um, it would invite, um, perhaps, out-of-state money to come into my local board elections if my board was not favorably disposed to a startup charter or a conversion charter. Um, we could well see out-of-state money come into local board elections, such as L.A. saw. Uh, that raises concern about local support. And, of course, it's the superintendent and the school board that goes out and raises local support for those taxes that pay for schools and the resources that ultimately would be changed, uh, transferred to charters through the 10 mil um, transfer, uh, the 10 mils. And I would think in the future, ultimately, all the local money, uh, could, a claim could be made for that. So while the board and the superintendent get that support, they would have very little to say about, uh, in my view, under this bill, about operation of the schools. Thank you. And I have a question real quick. The $700 million that came in from that sector. Huh? Uh, $700,000. How much, uh, for what <coughs> types of organizations that $700,000? Waltons $700, and Netflix. Pardon me? Waltons, the owners of um, Walmart, right. and Netflix, the owner of Netflix were the two entities that provided that level of funding. Would not have been my guess. Uh, Senator Ross, you have a question? <laughs> thank you, and thank you so much for uh, for your presentation. But, uh, but something that was key to what you said, you talked about the uh, additional burden that was put on school systems in, in your experience <coughs> in Colorado. And in our view, when I'm looking at this legislation with the commission, as well as what the responsibility of the local schools is, is an additional burden. Uh, and I, I think I even said that it seems as though you just have to hire a whole department just to deal, whether it's one charter school or whether you have five or six. And it's the same with the State Board of Education, because while you have a commission, they have, I, I guess, the State Department basically is their uh, information provider, uh, executor in, in different things. So it, it's an actual financial burden on systems as well as, do, do you agree with that? Senator Ross, uh, yes sir, I do. Uh, from my personal experience in Colorado, uh, the gentleman I brought with me here to Alabama to be my chief financial officer had been my auditor for, fi for charter schools in, in Aurora. It was his full-time job. Uh, probably my finance department, half of our year was spent working among six schools, while the other 50 traditional schools took up the other half of the year. It's a huge burden because you never go visit these folks without your lawyer, because it's a contract, and you're talking about financial resources, and adherence to the, the requirements of that contract, and you get in very detailed debates about what the reimbursement rates are going to be. Ultimately, folks, this says may get services. I would argue they're going to be back. It will say the district will provide services. Not this year, but in a future year. And then there's a big debate about at what reimbursement rate, at what level of quality, and, and it never ends. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. I see what your presentation. Um, my concern is children going into the charter schools, and since the charter school board doesn't have to uh, make sure that the teachers or administrators are certified to teach or, or whatever, that we're putting our children at risk when they're being sold the story that because you go to a charter school, everything's going to be better, you're going to be, a, be, be or become a, a high achiever or a higher achiever. My concern is when that charter school is found not to be doing what it's supposed to be doing and it gets its license or uh, whatever the entity is called, the contract is revoked. What happens to those children who have been there under that, that uh, scenario? Yes, thank you. That's an important question. Um, I had uh, two charter schools that I put on a weekly allowance. They were supposed to be paid semi-annually. This bill would provide that the state pays them annually. So I would have no say so as a superintendent in their payments. In Colorado, I had to use week-to-week -week payment to bring discipline to the system to ensure that they were financially solvent and they were adhering to the requirements of their contract. Um, we came very close to closing, too. But it was a huge burden on the school system if we closed them. So we almost had to keep them running because they had a non-aligned curriculum. 
when they came back to the public schools, we weren't sure how to reintegrate them into the public system. We weren't sure how to get the students to a diploma. We have a 24 credit diploma. Their diplomas did not align, so the children would have suffered. Um, and of course, we knew if we didn't reauthorize, the state commission likely would. They never, they never turned down a charter, and they never revoked a charter. So you'd go through the political pain of revoking a charter at the local level, get the ire of the local board and the parents up, and then you'd be overturned at the state level. So the, the tend was to be human and say, let's just limp along and keep this thing running. Okay. Thank you, Thank you sir. Dr. Wardinsky, the next uh, three minutes this time will be uh, Billy Canary with the Business Council. <coughs> Welcome, Mr. Canary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, three words. Uh, we're focused on choice, student, and opportunity. Good morning. My name is William Carey. I serve as president and CEO of the Business Council of Alabama. We at the BCA are in the our part to improve public education because they are get the current generation of our employees and leaders. BCA represents over 750,000 working Alabamians, and as such, we are one of the largest consumers of this product called education. And we want to see it improve and greater opportunity. In that vein, we support this legislation creating public charter schools in Alabama. The journey started, I thought about this this morning, over 3,000 days ago in this room. And now we're here. And I thank all of you for this opportunity. The BCA's 2015 legislative agenda includes support for education and workforce development. We pledge to work actively to fully implement recommendations and conclusions of the Business and Education Alliance of Alabama's 2014 report that calls for pursuing the goal of obtaining a 90% high school quality and quantity graduation rate by the year 2020. Our agenda also includes support for fully implementing the Alabama Board of Education plan in 2020 and that of Dr. Bites, and support for sustaining appropriate funding for proven educational initiatives. We support dual enrollment and career tech training. We believe that public charter schools will be another tool to use as we strive for education excellence that we will prepare our children for fulfilling the future. Like publicly funded magnet schools that draw students from within district, charter schools can be an attractive alternative to parents of children who, due to geography, are locked into a situation where they cannot fulfill their, their full potential. Andy Andrews is a very inspirational person in my life. He wrote in his best-selling novel, The Noticer, a life filled with opportunities and encouragement finds more and more opportunities and encouragement, and success becomes inevitable. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Canary. Uh, next speaker is... Wait, go ahead, Rita. Right. <laughs> um, Mary Ann Hayward yeah. from the American Federation of Teachers. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> My name is Mary Ann Hayward. I'm president of the Jefferson County American Federation of Teachers. I represent over 200 teachers and support workers in 12 school districts who serve 103,000 students. At no time has anyone come to me and said, we need charter schools. What I hear in the, in the public is, why doesn't the state fully fund education? We are tired of having to sell wrapping paper and bake sales so schools can buy toilet paper. I also hear, why does my middle school student have to be in a class of 35 students? And Senator, I think you got a little bit of a taste of that this morning when you were trying to call this group to order. And I think that taking money out of public schools will increase the class size, which makes it more difficult. If this committee and the legislature is interested in true education reform, we don't need out-of-state corporations coming into Alabama whose only interest is making money at the expense of our children. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we have Sharon Lee, the Birmingham parent. Ms. Lee. Sure. And the next speaker will be Senator Smith and Randall Lee. Okay, after Ms. Lee, you're up, Senator. Oh. <laughs> Welcome to the committee. You have three minutes. <coughs> My name is Sharon Lee. I reside at 1317 East Street in Birmingham. I'm a mother of five children, three of which were educated in the public school system of Birmingham. I want to tell you about my son Douglas. My son Douglas was diagnosed with ADHD. And because of our zip code, we weren't able to move him away from the school that he was going for. And that brought about a lot of problems because the faculty and staff decided that they would rather have him put on Ridley as opposed to trying to educate our son. Now this brought about all kinds of problems because he has low self-esteem. He started to withdraw from family. He withdrew from friends. Because it was it just got so bad. When my hands was tired, we had to go to court, and it came down to I to come and put him on Ritman. When he was put on Ritman, they gave him straight A's. He was not a straight A student. When I took him off of it, they gave him straight F. He was not a straight F student. So this back and forth just destroyed him. Even to the point where my son contemplated committing suicide. So I know firsthand, and that's just one of the, one of the stories. Just one. Each one of my children learns differently. And parents need choice. If I had a head of choice to move my son, I would have in a minute without hesitation. But when your hands are tied, your hands are tied. We need options. We need options. And private school was not an option because I couldn't afford it. I couldn't afford it. So my zip code shouldn't determine the level of education that our child or our children should get. I came here today to ask to please pass the charter school legislation. Please pass that. We need, we need an alternative. Because we can't continue doing the same thing and expect different results. All right. Thank you. Uh, Can I ask a brief yes, Senator. I'm sorry. Senator Sanders. children uh, in the school system that have the same problem. Yes, sure. Okay. I love and, and second, um, then don't all of those children have the right to have this problem corrected? They have the right to, okay. but depending on circumstances. Okay. And, and, what, 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 what they and, and, and isn't it conceivable that charter schools may not cure your problem. Of course. So, char let me first just say, charter school is not a home board. It's an alternative. Mm -hmm. I would have appreciated the alternative. Mm -hmm. I would have appreciated that as mm -hmm. just to be able to have that alternative. Mm -hmm. Just found a found little thing. Um, Thank you. Okay, go ahead, sir. Found um, Don't we need a solution that cure the problem you raise for every child throughout the public school system. With all due respect, sir, there's no one solution for every child because we're different. We're different. Right. We're different. What works for you may not work for me. What works for me may not work for you. But we all have the same right 
That's the thing. We need the right. We need to have that right. As citizens. That's the thing that we share. We are all equal in that we are citizens of Alabama. And we should have that right. We should have that choice. Right. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, our next speaker will be, uh, please, we need to hold it down. I'm trying to let as many people speak as possible. Uh, Senator Smither, you're up. And it's not every day we get a constitutional law professor in the Education Committee. Welcome. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you, too. But you still only get three minutes. <laughs> well, well, you know how we do it on Night from China's dad, don't start the clock yet. That's okay. <laughs> uh, to the committee, and, uh, to, the, to the members of the committee, and, and uh, of course to Mr. Pro Team, good to see you. I, I, I want to say this first, and, and I'm going to try to be fast because you said I had three minutes. In, in the, I, I'm the senator for Birmingham, I, when I said that, because I represent about 65% of the city. And I can clearly tell you that there are schools and there are uh, uh, programs and there are services that will provide for any student that may have a disability. So let's start with every elementary school. Every elementary school has students in there who may have cerebral palsy, who may have hearing problems, can't hear at all, who cannot speak, who have a side effect. They teach it. And there's an integrated process that you have normal students out of the community that go right to school with these young, young people. And it, the most beautiful thing in the world to see is to see a kid that's in a wheelchair and a kid that's talking in sign language, talking to another kid uh, uh, a couple steps away, and they're playing. And then the, the, the other kid come up and, and tag the one in the wheelchair, the one in the wheelchair take off out them trying to get them. You know, I said that just to say that. It, in our public school system, we have the mechanism and the integration of our students to address those problems. So I want to make that very clear that that exists. Uh, uh, in fact, I was a parent of that, to, to know that to be certain. But the thing that concerns me the most, of course, you heard what everybody has said about the, uh, about the funds and about what's going to take place. That's true. Uh, we can say what we want to, but that's true. We, we can say we like charter schools, and I know there are people in here who are for it, and, and people not. But the facts, what you hear, are true. I've done my own personal research. Those facts are true. The thing that concerns me the most is the simple fact that we're going to take public funds and we're going to put them in private people's hands and we're not going to have any accountability that's going to take place with those public funds. The second thing that concerns me that it, it almost sits on the edge of, 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 of and I, if you ever read my article, you'll know that I said it, it almost sits on the edge of racism. And it sits on that edge because all we're talking about is these urban, school, urban schools and centers. Now you all can get the Get the beautiful picture that we talk about the state of Alabama, or whatever. But when the negotiation gets through with us in that Senate, the final bill that come out is going to face Mobile, Birmingham, Montgomery, and Huntsville. It's just that simple. They don't work in rural areas. So now you're going to come into these urban areas, you which predominantly African American, most of them, and you're going to take the resources out of there, and then you're going to set up these charter schools, and you're going to segregate these kids that are not going to have any money that right now we don't have any money. Not going to have any money, any resources for tutoring, for assistance, or any other thing that they need, equipment or whatever. And you're going to lead them back here. You're going to let them come in and cherry pick the best, the top. You're going to let them weed them out on the back end, the DNL students, and then you're going to keep the money over there. That's what you're doing. You're setting up two systems, and you're setting the first beginning process of segregation all over again. Senator Smithman. Yes, sir. We're going to have to leave the segregation there. That's three minutes. That's three minutes. Three minutes and 16 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I believe. That's as fast as three minutes. I so, 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 can I kind of wrap up? Okay. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, so, what, what I want to say to you here is this, simply this, is that we have a public school system. You know, it's nothing perfect is in this world. Nothing. But together, together, we can be able to fix our system to whatever the problems are. But we don't need two dual systems. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come too far to start the first phase of reconstruction all over again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Uh, would you call the next speaker, please? Catherine Orderman, the teacher from Montgomery. You have three minutes? Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Catherine Ordeman, and I am a teacher from a family of teachers. My grandmother taught at San Hope Elmore. She was an English teacher there. Um, I would like to address that I think that our school system right now pretty much describes what you just said. We have magnet schools in Montgomery that skim the top percent off of our population, and then 97% of the children at my school are African American and 100% are on free and reduced lunch. So I would argue that our schools are pretty segregated right now, and that charter schools would do a lot to fix that. I'd also like to address. I'd also like to address the comments of this home school superintendent. Um, I've worked with several charter schools in New Orleans, most recently Renew Cultural Arts Academy, which is a school on the rise. Renew has actively addressed the issues of special needs and English as a second language within their walls. Um, their integration and one-on-one -on -one instruction of these populations is inspiring, and we would do well to follow that model, which is something we could do with charter schools that we can't currently do now. Charter schools are particularly effective for high-needs populations, such as students with special needs, English language learners, and underserved students like those <coughs> in Montgomery at Jefferson Davis. 97% um, of our, school, our students are African American, and most of the others are recent immigrants to the U.S. who do not know English. 100% are on free and reduced lunch, and these are the children that charter schools will benefit the most. Um, at JD, we are over capacity and have fallen behind under Alabama's current school system. I love my kids, but the gap between where they are and where they need to be is not only <laughs> scary to face, it is difficult to surmount, and we have allowed these children to fall by the wayside, and that's simply unacceptable. Let me be clear, this did not happen overnight, and the education gap has slowly grown over time. But here's the thing about the education gap. Our generation may not have caused this problem, but we can solve it. This bill comes down to choice. There are students and parents in our community who can afford to make that choice, to send their children to private schools. My students cannot afford to make that choice. The choice to choose a school that will best suit their individual needs. And that is a better publicly funded option. They need a publicly funded option, like a charter school, to choose from between Jefferson Davis and something else. That choice is empowering. Regardless of what you choose, the ability to select your school and where you teach or work is empowering. It means you are choosing to become a part of a team that will fight with all their heart for your kids and become, to allow them to become everything they aspire to be. Whether that's choosing to save Jeff Davis or Lee High School or choosing to go to a charter school, you are choosing that team. Okay, we're going to have to leave it right there with the team. Thank you very much. Uh, clerk will call the next speaker, please. Sally Howell from the Alabama Association of School Boards. <coughs> Welcome to the meeting. You have three minutes. And I'll be brief because I don't think we needed to be brief, but I think I'd be remiss without thanking you, Senator Marsh, Representative Collins. She was here um, for your efforts. This bill keeps getting better, and that's how the process is supposed to work. And while I'm standing here on the opponent's side, I really appreciate all that you've done, and particularly the substitutes. Um, and also, Emily, thank you for the, your commitment to really high-quality charter schools. And I think with all due respect to all the previous speakers, I think when we talk about choice, we really miss the mark. If we talk about student success, that's where we need to be and quality because a poor choice is not really a choice at all. And it's from that standpoint that I have, uh, would like to address two points. First of one is already addressed in the um, substitute. Uh, the virtual, the taking out of the virtual charter school, we greatly appreciate. Um, virtual charter schools in other uh, states have shown consistently <coughs> not to have high performance and not to be accountable. And so I'm really glad that we're not going to go down that road. But I don't want anyone here to leave thinking that we don't support virtual education. In fact, I'm eager look, eagerly looking forward to, Senator Brubaker, the public hearing on your bill, um, SB 72. That bill has had a lot of input from superintendents, school board members, practitioners across the state, and it would require every school board to offer a virtual option. And we think that ensures the kind of quality. So that issue has been addressed. Our second issue involves, of course, as the local control people, local control. We have some concerns about the commission being, over, uh, being able to overturn the decision of a local school board, and many of the provisions in the substitute, particularly the majority vote, are a step in that direction. Um, if you read the bill closely, it requires a school board authorizer to have a strategic plan for uh, charter schools. 
and it requires the school board authorizer to identify educational needs. What we think would be very important is that the commission needs to give deference to that strategic plan and to those educational needs in looking at uh, overturning a school board's decisions. Again, the substitute takes a step in that direction, is closer there, and we appreciate that. If we could tweak it a little bit more, I think we'd be just a little faster. But thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much. Next speaker. One, one quick point. Go ahead, sir. He's back. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, um, I, I, even the substitute does not provide for any kind of criteria for certification of, of preparation. Um, does, does, in, in your professional experience, does that mean that we could end up having a lot of students get even worse education than they get now? Uh, based on the accountability provisions, I think not. The charter has to have uh, cert performance standards, and if they don't make those performance standards, uh, based on student performance, the charter would be revoked, and the, the school board authorizer would have to constantly monitor it. So I don't believe that that would be the case. And if it's the case, I think we need to take a strong stand and close the school down. If, if in that five years down the road. No, I, I don't believe so. I believe if there are serious problems that are uh, uncovered, that you can get in there a little bit quicker than that, and that will be how we train school board authorizers to do so. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Yes, Senator Ross. But to to that point, to that point. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, but, but but to the very point, if I determine that if you started a school year, and I determine that a school is not functioning the way it should be, that it has been approved, and you say we could get to it a lot quicker and just shut it down, where does that put our children at that particular time in a system that is already provided for? The, uh, the year. I mean, that puts a burden on your school board as well as the school superintendent to have to replace these students and also find, you know, personnel. Does that not cause that type of problem? I, I think that that's something we have to do, but hopefully we're already doing that with our, our current public schools when we look at their performance criteria and we get in there and have a little bit of an education and swap team. But yes, it, it, it's right. not easy. I, I won't deny that. It's not, um, but it, and it is burdens. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, I want, we're going to, the public hearing's got about 15 minutes left, and we're going to uh, rejoin the committee meeting. So uh, the next speaker is. We have Dr. Joe Morton from the Business Education Alliance, and after that, we're going to have Janet <coughs> Rod. She's a president of the Festival Thank you, Dr. Morton. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to be with you. Uh, Thank you, Coach Jim Marsh, for the sponsorship of this and for the college for that in the house. Uh, I represent the Business Education Alliance of Alabama. It's a foundation that is devoted to getting business leaders, education leaders together and work on common solutions. We think this is the best example yet. In 2010, as State Superintendent of Education, I stood before a joint committee meeting of the House and the Senate on the first ever charter school bill in Alabama. It went down to ignominious defeat. Um, it was not that great of a bill. In 2013, I stood before committees on yet another charter school bill. I was retired at that time, but still committed to the fact that every child needs an opportunity to go to a high quality school. There a lot of work went on, in on that in 2013, but there again, at the end of the day, when the dust settled, the bill did not pass. Today, before you, with the substitute, is clearly the very best charter school bill ever written for the state of Alabama, and in my opinion, and I don't profess to know every one by heart, but for the past five years I've studied it a whole lot, it is one of the best, if not the best, charter school bill in the United States. It has... There is an advantage to being last sometimes, and we are last. We are one of the last states to come to the party on charter schools. But one of the advantages is you learn from others' mistakes. So when people throw up and say, well, in Arizona, they don't have a lot of success. Well, in Arizona, their charter school bill is about 20 years old. This one is brand new, so we can learn from the mistakes of those that went before us. And I think that's exactly what the authors of this bill have done. Twenty years ago, the education achievement gap for students in Alabama between high-performing and low-performing students was 20, almost 29 points 
on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. 20 years ago, it was a 29-point gap. Today, it's a 29-point gap. And we know what's going on. Children of poverty generally get the short end of the educational stick in Alabama. Not because it's designed that way, it is a fact. And we have to find ways and avenues to get them equal opportunity. The lady from Birmingham nailed it. Her zip code makes sure that her students, her children, are in the school they are assigned for life. It is a life sentence. If they draw a good life sentence, they get a good education. If they draw a poor life sentence, we know the answer. It's not pretty. This gives the opportunity to get children out of their zip code and into a quality alternative if their parents want them. So, one other thing, and then I'll, I'll sit down. A lot of people no, are looking... I don't, think, I don't think we're going to get to the one other thing. Okay. <laughs> Let me just throw in conversions may be the safer <laughs> gift of this whole act. Well, all right. right. Those that are uh, originated within the local board of education. Okay. Well, I'm glad you got that out. <laughs> I have a I have a question for the former superintendent, uh, former state superintendent of public education. Yeah, feel like like old times. No, not quite. Uh, Mr. Martin, <laughs> you say that the children in poverty in the state get the short end of the stick, and you knew that when you were state superintendent. Can you tell us what did you do as state superintendent? to tackle that problem or to make sure that those children received the same opportunity that every other child did, but because they were poor, they didn't. But what did you do with the power you had as superintendent to help them? I helped originate the Alabama Reading Initiative so that every child could read at grade level by the end of the third grade. I helped create the Alabama Man Science Technology Initiative so that every child would have quality education in math and science throughout their public school career. I supported charter schools. Um, I fought for, within the legislative body, uh, visited with Senator Sanders, the chairman of the Senate Finance and Taxation Committee, probably a lot more than he wanted to pursue avenues for children at risk. We, at one time, had uh, I think the total ended up being $7 million that we gave to schools that showed increased student performance, especially for those at risk. And Dr. Horton, I'm going to cut it off there. I don't think that's directly related to the bill, so let's, I'm trying to let as many people speak because they've come a long way. And would you call the next speaker, please? Thank you, Dr. Horton. As a committee member, Senator, with all due respect, I thought that we could ask the presenters any question we wanted to. And in my, in my view, it has a lot to do with the bill. It has a lot to do with him coming before this committee, using his influence to influence us. Okay. So that's I think why everybody I got a question. Point. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Who's next? And thank you, Mr. Moore. Rod, principal from Tuscaloosa.
such as personal growth of the principal, personal growth of teachers, and most of all, personal growth of our students and their creativity and creating and helping them with creating a positive image of themselves. Last but not least, the school culture is and has to be warm, inviting, have a family atmosphere where all are felt loved, valued, and challenged. You see, I've had the distinct pleasure of working in two low-performing schools. The first school was on the verge of being taken over by the State Department of Education. However, within one year, we went from not making AYP to receiving over $18,000 from the state for continuous school improvement. In the last school where I was principal, Dr. Tommy Bice made this statement that Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School should be the model school for school improvement. You see, it doesn't matter what we do, because in the end, if we do not have quality leaders, our children will still not get what they need. What we need is innovative change agents in all of our schools so that we can make sure that we are preparing students for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And our next uh, speaker is... Kristen McAdory. And we're going to hear Kristen McAdory and one other. And after and then that, we're going to have Anita Gibson. Anita Gibson, and that will wrap us up because we'll be out of time. All right. <laughs> Ms. McAdory, where are you? Okay, here we go. Ms. Okay, you are, you're up. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Kristen McAdory, and I am a public school teacher in Bessemer, Alabama, where also our students, um, we, at my school, we have a 100% um, free and reduced lunch. We're 99% African American. My elementary school feeds into a high school that has a 36% graduation rate. As a public educator, when you put your hard work in an elementary school, you see a 36% graduation rate. You know that there's a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, I'm here in support of charter schools for a few reasons. One of the reasons being, it gives you flexibility in curriculum. It gives you the freedom to be innovative. Um, we had a push for differentiated instruction where we know that each student comes from a different background and we need to teach them in different ways. <coughs> if the student doesn't learn the way you teach them, you teach the way that they learn. With our students coming from so many different backgrounds, we have different lifestyles. There are so many different and diverse home lives that our students live. We also have to differentiate our environment. Students will not learn the same way. They will not learn in the same environment, and we have the power to do something about that. Another reason that I support charter schools would be that I see those students that don't make A's and D's, but they have the potential to take something apart with their hands and put it back together with no instructions. That takes a different type of mindset. Why not put them in a school where that pushes them, where that drives them? Our goal is not to shut down public schools. Nobody wants to see that but to give them high quality options, give them more options, give them a place to grow, a place to learn, a place to grow into themselves. I'm here as a teacher, as an educator, and I would like for you all to support the charter school. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our uh, speaker. We have Anita Gibson. She's a teacher and member of AEA. Good morning and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Anita Gibson and I'm a teacher from DeKalb County. During my 25 year career, most of my years were spent in a high school at Clayton High School where I taught grade kindergarten through fifth grade. I'm here today to talk to you about the strength of Alabama schools and the communities that surround them. One of the greatest joys that I had as a teacher 
was working with children and watching them grow, explore, and succeed in my classroom and throughout their lives. Because an Alabama education doesn't end when the bell rings. I would see those same children, their siblings, and their friends around my town. I knew their parents, and in some cases, had actually come <laughs> in my class when they were children. We all know what I'm talking about. Most of us grew up in an Alabama community school. The schools that we have built were put there by the people in the local community. They're maintained and they're attended by generations of people within the community. And the educators, administrators, parents, and local officials work together to grow and adapt to changes as needed. Our teachers are trained professionals who meet Alabama's high standards. And I can speak from this personal experience on this, this point. We continually work to strengthen our skills and provide the best education possible to our children. I mention this because I believe it is very critical for us to remember what is working in our education system and what we need to protect as we consider new paths forward. The current version of SB 45 lowers teacher quality standards by exempting charter schools from state teacher certification requirements. Why would we divert millions of dollars from our public schools to fund a school with less prepared educators? The bill also, in its current form, opens the door to chaos and confusion for the school districts and potential charter students and their families. Without any requirements for a unified school plan, this bill is dangerously inadequate. The loss of local control, quite frankly, frighten, is frightening to small communities throughout Alabama who take great pride in their local schools. Local school boards represent the values of the men and women and families <coughs> who reside in their communities. Doesn't government and our schools exist best when we're closest to the people we serve. It is imperative that this bill create a system that will take our responsibility to our students seriously and will ensure that all schools within a district are set up for success. When I think back on some of my fondest memories as a teacher, I'm reminded of those children whose minds were open to possibilities they never considered. I'm reminded of parents who were engaged in school, both in their children's classroom and as supporters of the football team and the bands on Friday nights. I'm reminded of the real sense of community, community that existed around our school. The school is part of the town, and the town is part of the school. And now, that's, time. that's your time. I'm going to have to leave it there. Any questions? Nope. Okay. Uh, with that said, we're going to go back into committee meeting. For those of you who didn't get to speak, I appreciate you coming. I will be in my office for the next uh, hour after this meeting, and I'll be happy to talk to anybody who didn't get a chance to address the committee uh, that, that wishes to, to speak to me. That's in room 733. Uh, so we are, I'm calling, we call the meeting back, uh, the Education Policy Committee back in order. The substitute for SB 45 is before Senator Marsh, with your pleasure. If I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, first I want to say I want to thank everybody for being here today. And I know this, regardless of your position today, I, I do want to believe, as I do believe, that everybody in this room, including those around this table, believe in the best education possible for the children of this day. We're, we're all together on that. We may differ in how we get there. Um, something tells me, Mr. Chairman, and I have the votes to get this out of the committee, and I think we got the votes to pass this, but I hope I have displayed and will continue to display, even as this process moves forward, to move, to, to work with those who, who have opposition, try to find a way to get it better. Because we do want that. We want the best possible charter bill we can possibly buy to the students of this state and public system. So with that, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your actions and, and accommodating me on this today. And with that, I would move for favor of the board for the substitute. And let me get a second first, and then I recognize there a second. I right, salute by Senator Mark Crankle, seconded by Senator Bussman, Senator Sanders. Um, <clears throat> Senator Marsh, we, uh, pro tem, we, we really appreciate your remarks. Um, but it, it seems to me that after we have heard from all of these witnesses, it would be better if we could have some time, even a day, even 24 hours, uh, to digest all of that, to go back and look at and, and find a way to take what we have. And I, I would hope that you would consider 
as carrying this over uh, until tomorrow to whatever time the chair sets. Um, I, I would like to digest it, and I, I believe all these people who are here who've heard these different points of view would like to go back and do that before we pass it out of committee. I'm going to, uh, so is that a motion to carry it over for 24 hours? I mean, are you making a motion or are we? Yeah, yeah, I, I'd like to make a substitute motion to carry it over for 24 hours. Is there a second? All right, the motion is to... I move, the, I move to table that motion. Okay, with 3D, we now have a table motion from the sponsor. I'll second. And so the vote now is on the tabling motion for Senator Sanders' substitute motion. That's 3D, that's right. Okay, so the clerk will call the roll. Senator, if you want to table it, your vote is aye. If you don't, your vote is no. Senator Busman? Aye. Senator Figures? No. Senator Marsh? Aye. Senator McClendon? Senator Pittman? Senator Rawls? No. Senator Sanders? No. Senator Shelman? Aye. Senator Brubaker? Aye. Okay. We are now back on the motion for favorable report. Senator Figures. I have what I believe is a friendly amendment that my uh, Board of Education asked me to. to okay. Get a copy for everybody. All right. If the clerk would read the amendment, then we'll let Senator Figures explain it. On page 12, line 19, after the period, insert the following. The, com the commission may grant an application for the formation of a public charter school by the applicant if it finds that the local school board's denial was arbitrary and unsupported by the substance of the charter application. On page 18, after line 13, insert the following new paragraph. F. Section F. Find that the local school board's denial was arbitrary and unsupported by the substance of the charter application. Mr. Chairman. Sir Tamar. I, I had agreed, of course, today to do several things in the substitute with the intent of getting it out today. I will commit to center figures because I can assure you that what's likely what will happen is we'll see possibly another substitute on the floor. And I would ask that because I've asked us not to put these amendments on that I will work with you this amendment this afternoon and, and talk with uh, Ms. Schultz and others and see how this fits. I'm just hesitant to take any amendment at this time. It's fine, as long as you're open. I, I am open to it. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so I'll draw the amendment, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Senator Figures. Um, and I assume that what you're saying is that we're going to do it. If other people have amendments, as I said earlier, with this process continues, we'll be, I'm sure you meet with, with colleagues and others who have interest in this legislation. Uh, before we come to the floor sometime. Well, it'll only get a second reading tomorrow. Before it's on Tuesday. Before it's, uh, before it's on Tuesday or where, whenever it may be. It's based on those discussions. Thank you. So that would mean we have between now and Monday, in the day Monday. Yes, sir. If I may, just to say, I'm, I'm going to vote against this, this bill. And the reason is, is because, number one, it takes money away from our already um, education trust fund where we do not adequately fund education, public education in the state of Alabama. We haven't, um, ever, I don't think. But I also believe that every child should have that opportunity for an excellent education, which is why I had hoped, and I've, I have spoken to this um, in the past, that we would concentrate on our public education system as it is already, and that we would do everything that we could to make it an excellent system, uh, an excellent um, entity across the entire state. Uh, if Dr. Tommy Bice can take schools that were low performing schools and turn them into blue ribbon schools, and one school, actually I went to that school, and it was not a low performing school when I went there many, many years ago, but George Hall Elementary, and that is like a national school of uh, high performing and uh, achieving school. And if we're able to do that with our public schools, I think that we should give him what he needs to do that with every public school because every child can learn and every child deserves an opportunity for an excellent education. And it's for those reasons that I am against this bill because there are still going to be children left out and left behind. 
I was not for No Child Left Behind. I remember telling Secretary Rod Page that it was very contradictory because many children were going to be left behind, and that's exactly what happened. And I think the same thing is going to happen to this, that every child deserves the same opportunity. Thank you. And I do thank you, Senator Marsh, for, for your work in this. I thank you for your openness. And I hope that you will continue to be open until we can really work this thing out. And Senator Figures, anyone who has <coughs> served with you <coughs> knows that uh, your, knows your passion for public schools and your uh, focus on the least served, and we all appreciate that. Senator Sanders. Um. <coughs> I am uh, I'm always concerned when something is moving like grease lightning. Uh, and usually that 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 portends trouble and I'm concerned about that. Second, uh, I'm concerned that the way this commission is set up that this will be not an education uh, initiative, but it will be a political initiative. And, and I hate to see that. Number three, we have a long history of finding various ways um, to further separate. And, uh, and, 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 and in the end, our children end up suffering. Um, this, 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 this may very well provide uh, a, 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 an opportunity for excellence for a few children. But it's going to be at the expense of men, and we have to find a way to achieve excellence for all of our children. For those and for many other reasons, if I had more time, I would say that I'm opposed to this bill. I think it's going to be bad for education. I think those people who hope that somehow they're going to end up, uh, their children doing better, their children will be doing worse and a lot of other children will be doing worse because resources will be taken uh, from those that are there. We don't have enough as it is. We're dividing that which is already too little. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Ross? Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, I'm amazed at how you can preordain that this bill will pass today. But uh, in all due respect, Mr. Chairman, I want to say that uh, I appreciate your willingness to, to work on this issue. Uh, it's a very important issue, but, uh, you know, I liken it to uh, wanting the charter schools, wanting all the privileges of public funding, but none of the accountability that comes with it, from certification to uh, ensuring that those who are in the classrooms with our, our students uh, are, are prepared to deal with them. I understand what it is, giving curriculum breadth and the flexibility necessary for students to achieve. Being a classroom teacher, being an administrator, uh, on all levels, I understand what it is uh, to give opportunity and choice to young people. If this were a bill that was going to ensure that the child that leaves my school every day was going to get a hot meal at home, if this was going, this was a bill that was going to ensure that the child that leaves my school every day would have somebody there to watch them and be with them and help them do their homework. If this bill was going to ensure that they would have the clothes necessary to put on their backs when they come through my building, then I may have a different take on that. But it's not. What it's doing is taking very limited funding from the schools that we already have. And for that reason, I, I am adamantly against uh, this charter school idea. I heard the young lady say that it gives them choice. She's a school teacher. But I was a magnet school principal who taught in a traditional school. And I said time and time that the students that I had at the magnet school, if I took the expectation and took those teachers to that school, those students that I taught in traditional schools probably would outperform the, te the students that were in the magnet school. So it's really the expectation and the groundwork that's laid by leadership in the school that makes the difference. Because if we're not undergirding those problems that these students face on a daily basis, then we're really not doing anything to solve the problem. Yes, you say it's giving school choice, but really it's propelling them further into a situation that we won't be able to gain control of. But having said that, even with the accountability bill that, has, that was passed and I've had problems with, we've since then talked about, we provided the flexibility 
to these school systems to do some innovative things. And we have those systems doing it today. And I heard talk with superintendents last night asking the question, why won't we give the flexibility and opportunity to work before we begin to infuse these things, before we begin to dilute the ability of the State Department that has been moving in a direction unlike any other, to work before we add something else uh, to their plate and really something that they don't have control of. But having said all those things, I agree with you that those in this room are dedicated to all of our children. But if this bill passes, I assure you that it is going to be more devastating than what we've seen in public education students throughout the state of Alabama. But again, I want to say that I appreciate working with you. I appreciate you listening. And it seems as though you're going to listen even more. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Senator. And now the vote is on whether or not to give SB 45 a favor report. Clerk, Paul Roll. Senator Bussman? Aye. Senator Figures? No. Senator Marsh? Aye. Senator McClendon? Senator Pittman? Senator Ross? No. Senator Sanders? No. Senator Shelnut? Aye. Senator Brebaker? Aye. Okay, so SB 45 receives a favor report. This meeting is adjourned. And for anyone who didn't get to speak, I'm chairman of the committee.